Coming up next on this special Veterans Day edition of Arizona Horizon, an update on concerns regarding the Phoenix VA health care system. We'll hear from a veterans group that faced struggles because of their skin color and gender, and we'll learn about the Arizona Veterans Hall of Fame. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to this special Veterans Day edition of Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. We begin with an update on the Phoenix VA healthcare system, including word that another interim executive has been put in charge of the medical center. The Arizona Republic's Dennis Wagner has been on this VA story from the get-go. You broke this thing and you are still working it. And I imagine you'll be still working it for some time. Good to have it's you here. It's gotten tiring. Yeah, yeah I, I imagine. And, uh, let's start with this. Another new interim director? Who are we talking about here? We've got a, a, a gentleman by the name of Glenn Grippen who's coming in. He is a former uh, director at VA Healthcare Centers and at um, some of the re a regional office who also was uh, an assistant undersecretary or assistant deputy undersecretary. I can never get all those things yeah. together. He went into retirement a few years ago and they've pulled him out of retirement. Um, it has been, like I said, a revolving door. Um, they put norm they've been putting people in there for 120 day stints. So he's like the third or fourth one to come in. He is going to be given a one year tour in Phoenix. And the reason for that, I think, if my impression is, is because members of Congress have been dogging the VA saying, we have no permanent leadership here. Give us some stability. We're trying to overcome uh, a crisis. Well, why is the VA putting, what were the previous executives, why were they put on those short leashes? What was going on there? The reason for that is because under VA policy or protocol, when an administrator is placed on leave or a suspension, that person still is technically holds the job. So they don't put somebody in there permanently to replace them because if, for example, the reasons that Sharon Hellman was the director of the hospital, she's now on, been on paid leave for like six months or five months. And so she still technically would be entitled to that job if she isn't fired. So they can't fill the job permanently. Why hasn't she been, has anyone been fired over this? Not at Phoenix VA, no. There's three administrators who were placed on leave. They're all collecting their paychecks and have been since I think around May 1st. And um, that is a point, a bone of contention for people like Senator John McCain and uh, Representative Kristen Sinema who are, have just been hounding. And, and also the House Committee Chairman, Representative Jeff Miller, they've all been just hounding the VA, if you had reason to put these guys on leave and said that they had done wrong and the OIG found that there was wrongdoing, why haven't they been fired? And they aren't getting answers. There have been kind of answers. First they were saying, well, they have due process rights in the federal personnel system. That has kind of abated that argument. And now there's an argument that, well, there's criminal investigations ongoing and we can't interfere with those. But the Justice Department came out just recently and said, well, it's, it's, it's no problem for us. Whatever you do with your administrators is your business. So now I don't know what the answer is. Oh my goodness. Okay, and as far as the VA, the National VA is concerned, uh, the Inspector General's report, the OIG, as you mentioned earlier, um, it, it sounds like there's no information on that that suggests that maybe some folks were pushing for changes to that critics are calling a bit of a whitewash. What's going on with that? The, it more than suggests it. We, the, there have been, the VA released to the House Committee released emails that showed that the headquarters of VA was asking for additions to the Inspector General report. They got a draft copy before it was made public. And those additions that they wanted, the main addition they wanted was language that would say, well, wait, we don't have any proof that anybody in Arizona died because of the, f the delayed care to veterans. And that language was sought um, by the then secretary, acting secretary of the VA. Um, gosh, I just had a mental blabse. That's all right, and, and and also, the yeah, he's the acting and, secretary. And, and, and a White House appointee who was supposed to kind of be riding herd on the VA. And it, 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 we don't know exactly what language they pushed for, but language of that nature ended up in the report and became very controversial. It caused Sam Foote, who was a whistleblower, who said he never said that there was were patients in Arizona who died because of it, because he couldn't prove that. He said they died while awaiting care, and the government needs to investigate 
whether that delayed care contributed to their death. And I would imagine he would be among those calling this a whitewash. He was among those calling the, the report a whitewash, and he was among those who were saying that the, the revelation of these emails that showed um, pressure from the VA headquarters, he was saying, well, that more proves what I was saying already. Have, do you keep in contact with Dr. Foote? Yes, I do, all the time. What's he, what's he telling you? Just what I just yeah, what I just basically said. that every, everything he's, that he's he's I mean I just talked to him about whether he sees a cultural change coming at the VA or underway at the VA because um, I'm working uh, I'll have a story that will have been run by the time this show airs um, on that topic and he's kind of optimistic he thinks that the new uh, secretary uh, Robert McDonald um, is trying to make changes he's not sure that he can overcome a bureaucracy that's resistant to change but he seems hopeful the new executive director of the Phoenix VA system here for one year w will that gentleman do you think be the one to replace Hellman if and when she goes um, I have no information on that but it would I, I kind of doubt that somebody who went into retirement would decide to yeah. take the job permanently. That's true. Unless That's he got true. bored in retirement, and that could happen. Hey, a lot of folks retire to Phoenix, so yeah. you never know. He could be retiring and working. Also, you wrote about, and I found this fascinating, everything that, that all, many of the allegations in the Inspector General's report, Pete, we, the VA knew about this back in 2008. Yeah. Explain, please. It, it's, it's been puzzling because I know I put in FOIA public records requests to the VA and others have for every investigation or report that showed delays in care to patients that were caused by manipulation of wait times, the falsification of appointment records, they, they did things like they kept secret appointment records, they did um, uh, mass cancellation of appointments, those kinds of things, and it turned out although they didn't, it wasn't a public report that the um, Inspector General put out. In 2008, the Inspector General came in here to review the same exact kind of allegations that occurred here this year and found the same kinds of problems. And that report got leaked out now, and, or in the, a few weeks ago, and revealed that it's deja vu. Well, and, and again, this particular report was, there was failure to an oversight duty. Uh, they didn't publish reports. Uh, they hid the level of fraud, uh, failed to hold VA executives accountable. Uh, the IG called it a breakdown in training and procedural problems. But as you said, this just sounds like, hello. Yeah, and I think it's the most frustrating uh, or perplexing thing for um, the veterans themselves, the service organizations, the people in Congress who are looking at it, and they keep asking, why can't this ship change direction? It's like people try to steer it on course and it just slides sideways. And uh, I mean, there, it, there's just a, a really strong sentiment in Congress. Now I think it's pretty strong in both of the Veterans Affairs Committee that there is a lack of transparency, there's a lack of accountability, probably even more importantly from their perspective, and that those two issues create an inability to change a culture that's, a, that's, a, that's controlled by a bureaucracy. And yet, you're saying that with, with the new administration, or at least the latest acting director there, uh, there is hope, at least among Dr. Foote is, is mm -hmm. suggesting, there is hope that the ship is starting, or at least in mid term? You know, it depends on who I talk to, what answer I get on that, because I've talked to leaders of most of the major veterans organizations in the country in the last few days. I've talked to uh, multiple whistleblowers. They're all cognizant that any s real change at the VA will take time. They're looking at all of the rapid fire reform efforts and personnel turnovers that have occurred in the la and, and other actions that have occurred in recent months. And they're saying those are pretty superficial, but the fact that they're even doing those things gives an inkling of hope, a twinkle of a star. And so they're, I think they want to believe it and they're trying not to be total cynics. So they're saying we have hope for Robert McDonald and his new regime. And last question for you. I know you've been on, you, you broke this thing. I mean, this is, I, I did, when you, when you first started writing about this, when you first got information, you talked to Dr. Foote and all this stuff was, did you have any idea this story would be what it is? I knew it was a huge story. I knew that a story that talked about veterans who were having 
possibly dying and having clearly having adverse medical effects because they couldn't get in to see doctors that were waiting over a year to get care in a system that was uh, completely dysfunctional based on the information I had within weeks of first starting to talk to Dr. Foote. I knew all of that was a terrible, terrible mess and I knew it would gather national attention. I had no idea it would uh, go nuclear like it has. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've done remarkable work and you're still on it. We thank you so much for your work and thank you for appearing tonight on the special Veterans Day edition of Horizon. Thank, thank you so you, much. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. And on this Veterans Day, we highlight a group that doesn't often receive a lot of attention, a group that recently chose Phoenix to hold its 20th biennial reunion. Producer Christina Estes and photographer Scott Olson have the story. These women represent hundreds of years of military service. I'm Susie. S-D-E. I'm Eddie. They're members of the National Association of Black Military Women. Retired Army Colonel Stephanie Dawson is their leader. One of the key missions of uh, NABMW is to make sure that her story is told to round out his story. It's my sister. Like her sister, Dr. Doris Allen enlisted in the Army after graduating from college. This three-time Bronze Star recipient and member of the Military Intelligence Hall of Fame was motivated by her brother's World War II experience. He was shell-shocked, just like PTSD now. It's the same thing. But I saw that. I didn't recognize it, of course. And I asked him, well, what happened? And he was telling me uh, what happened. He got a Purple Heart anyway. And I said, I'm going to get him for that. She served three years in Vietnam as a POW interrogator and intelligence analyst. I was there for 10 combat campaigns. I drank every day. At least I didn't smoke pot. At least I didn't use drugs, other drugs. But I drank every day. And that was a release. Uh, many, many people drank in Vietnam. Many came home still alcoholics and drug addicts. And I thank God every day that I'm, I'm alive and well. Gratitude is on display at the group's reunion. Tables are covered with poster boards that highlight service women with a special focus on the World War II generation. And I remember seeing her. Major Charity Adams was the first African-American woman to be an officer in the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, later renamed the Women's Army Corps. Adams commanded the Army's Central Postal Directory Battalion. Known as 6888, it was the only battalion of black women to serve overseas during World War II. They worked in England and in France. Before Adams made history in Europe, she endured racism at home. In the early 1940s, Adams was among nearly 40 black women in the Corps' first training class held in Des Moines, Iowa. That's also where Azalea Oliver attended basic training. And it was interesting. We lived in a hotel. The blacks lived on the top three floors and the whites lived on the lower three floors. They did everything first and we did everything later. It didn't get any better after Oliver was sent to Fort Riley, Kansas. After a crash course in nursing, they had to care for soldiers who didn't care for them. Oliver says when a member of the Women's Army Corps, known as WAC, would complain, the captain would march them down to the commander's office. The commandant was from Texas, and he hated black people. And he used to say, here come them GD in WAC to complain. And it, was, it got to be a joke with us. We, we could laugh at that. But it also made a point because eventually we went down there so often that he put out a memorandum to the entire hospital that the next soldier who called a whack out of her name could go home dead or alive. He didn't care, but he wasn't having to put up with us anymore. It doesn't really make me mad. It um, makes me appreciate even more what they overcame. Whenever they show pictures of the past, what the country has done, or what a group has done. They always leave us out. But yet we're expected to perform willingly with smiles on our faces. 
Right now, I'm 80 years old, and if it were possible, I'd still be in the military. Sammy Clay enlisted in the Air Force at the age of 18 and served during the Vietnam and Korean Wars. It teaches young people, it teaches discipline, it teaches a degree of respect, it teaches, a, you know, it teaches all the things that I don't think they're learning right now. Recognizing the past was the goal of 20 women who gathered at a Virginia home in 1976. It marked the start of the National Association of Black Military Women. Thank you. The group has grown to six chapters with members in 28 states. This is my youngest daughter. <laughs> they hold reunions every two years <laughs> to remember the good and bad. We did it all. And to cherish the present. Life is okay. The war, war was then, but I live it every day. At night, at night, I dream, I still dream. I still have, I still have the startle effect. I still have all of those, those things that make you feel stupid sometimes when you, you get startled or whatever and people look at you and have to tell me, hey, I have PTSD. So, but that's all right, I'm fine. But when you've done your job well, and I think all of us feel that way, we did our job well and we have nothing more to prove. A 2011 study by the Pew Research Center found that black women enlist at far higher rates than white or Hispanic women, and they represent nearly a third of all women in the military. You can learn more about the National Association of Black Military Women at nabmw.com. We want to hear from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at arizonahorizon at asu.edu. The Arizona Veterans Hall of Fame Society honors veterans in the state for their contributions after military service. And here to tell us more is retired Army Colonel Chuck Schluter. Good to have you here on this Veterans Day. Thank you so much for joining us. Our pleasure, Ted. Thank you so much. Give us a definition now. What is the Arizona Veterans Hall of Fame? The Arizona Veterans Hall of Fame was created to recognize veterans after they had completed their military service, those who were contributing to their communities, helping other veterans, and all in all, making sure that veterans' activities were, were participated in and supported. Are there specific quali qualifications for nomination? I mean, how does that work? All Arizona veterans are eligible to be inducted, or I should say eligible to be nominated. Uh, there are about 650,000 veterans in Arizona. Each year, the Unified Arizona Veterans receives about 75 uh, nominations. There's a screening process, and they select between 20 to 25 veterans each year. That list is then sent to the governor's office for vetting and approval, and then it's returned. And the last Friday in October of every year, we have a very nice induction ceremony. And uh, this latest induction ceremony included Pat Tillman inducted this year, huh? It did. Uh, Pat Tillman, very special individual. Uh, I know that uh, this will air on uh, Veterans Day, but today is Pat Tillman's 38th birthday. Um, his wife is an incredible individual also. Uh, I think that uh, he was a role model for an entire generation right after 9-11. His self-sacrifices are uh, uh, immeasurable in many ways. Uh, and in his name and in his legacy, the Pat Tillman Foundation has continued on. Um, they are supporting students in uh, over 98 institutions across the United States, and they've contributed over $6 million to that education. Their goal, uh, similar to ours, is pretty lofty, but they want to educate the next generation of leaders in business, education, uh, science, technology, and they're doing it. Very, very good. Uh, I think someone would be surprised that Pat Tillman wasn't already inducted. What, what was that all about? That is the common answer when we would nominate him, and uh, I would ask for an endorsement from a legislator or a politician or a prominent individual. They would, you know, say, what do you mean he's not already inducted? Well, the, uh, sometimes it's a technicality. And the Veterans Hall of Fame is not a military Hall of Fame. It's for what did you do after military service. Now, there are precedents out there. 
Uh, Ira Hayes is is a is an, uh, is an, uh, a precedent for an individual who served his country honorably, did incredible things, and uh, after service uh, kind of faded away. Well, after service, Pat Tillman didn't have the opportunity to fade away, and he wasn't able to do anything after service. But he is an Arizona icon, and. We have bridges named after him, VFW halls named after him, American Legion posts named after him. Uh, every year, over 30,000 individuals run in the Pats, Pats Run. Uh, that's in April. And what you probably don't know is that across the entire globe, there are shadow runs with thousands more people running in his honor. And I, w I would say if with a Pat Tillman, with an Ira Hayes, yes, maybe uh, no opportunity or a uh, lesser chance to do something after the military service, but because of who they are, because of what they represent, what's being done in their name, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? It is. It's very impressive. And other individuals who've been inducted, who are still with us, um, they're, they're everyday folks who just left the service and went on with their career, whether it was in broadcasting or wherever. And they've got a fire in their belly, and they've got a tenaciousness about them that just caused them to rise above a few others and get recognized and get inducted. Uh, this past year, we inducted uh, uh, Dr. Michael uh, Harkins, Hawkins, and he was a judge, and he realized that veterans were going into courts, and they were not always ready to, to face the judicial system. And he... Uh, proposed a veterans court and it caught on and actually it's a nationally recognized program today mm. and Arizona is leading the way with veterans courts and three of our members who have judicial robes if you will serve as judges at those courts. As it's incredible. Far, it is incredible and other names we should mention Frank Luke, Barry Goldwater, John McCain, Ira Hayes among those inducted. I believe a gentleman named Chuck uh, Schuler is also uh, inducted. Congratulations to you sir. It's, a, it's an honor to serve with those people who have done so much, and it's, quite frankly, is rather humbling. I would imagine it so, is, but, but congratulations is. to you on that. As far as w where the Hall of Fame is located, can, can I go to the Hall of Fame? Can you visit? What's, how does that work? We don't have our own building. However, on December 7th this year, there will be an unveiling at the Capitol of the Arizona Veterans Hall of Fame uh, display. And there'll be plaques for every class from 2001 through 2014. There'll be a center plaque uh, depicting all of our Medal of Honor recipients. Um, and uh, there, there is a, a descriptive plaque that talks about how, the honor, how it came to be and uh, what it takes to get in. And uh, it'll be a very nice display. It's, it's going to cost us a couple of dollars, but it belongs in the Capitol Museum, and we're going to make sure it gets there. Is there any thought of maybe getting a standalone structure or standalone facility, or is that uh, a little bit down the road? That was uh, entertained several years ago, and uh, when, when you look into what it takes to open up a building, maintain it, air condition it, heat it, secure it, yeah. uh, we opted not to. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right, enough said there. Uh, as far as the induction ceremonies are concerned, how, how, you mentioned Pat Temple. That, that must have been a, 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 just an impressive occasion. It was incredible. Every time somebody is inducted, this was a, this was a sold out crowd and uh, standing room only, if you will. And when a person gets inducted, it's, pro it's, uh, it's routine that their family and friends stand and applaud. And uh, when Pat Tillman was inducted, it was uh, silent for a moment as a Pat Tillman scholar stood up to accept on the behalf of the Pat Tillman Foundation, a young man, graduate of ASU as a matter of fact, Air Force veteran. Uh, he stood up and it was silent for a moment and then the applause began and it just was a wave across the entire room and even the individuals who being honored and inducted on stage then stood up and joined them. It, uh, it, it was very, that was humbling I and it was imagine. wonderful. And quite frankly, uh, a, a good friend of mine, the host of the event, Rob Welsh, Colonel Rob Welsh, um, he had to reach for a glass of water to, uh, 
catch his breath, if you will. I would think a very inspiring situation. I think the enti that entire Veterans Hall of Fame sounds like an inspiring endeavor. Uh, congratulations to you uh, for representing the Hall of Fame and continuing your service there. Uh, thank you for all you've done for all of us, and thank you for appearing with us on this Veterans Day edition of Arizona Horizon. It was great having you here. Absolutely our pleasure. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. And Wednesday on Arizona Horizon, a new survey of real estate professionals indicates that the commercial market is shaky, but improving. We'll see what that means. Crunch a few numbers and have the latest. That's at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.